a blockbuster release. Panama Papers. The documents were leaked to the German newspaper Süddeutsche Zeitung. We turned out of the banking bombshell causing shockwaves around the world. Edward Snowden calling it the biggest leak in the history of data journalism. We need months of research, of fact-checking, of really digging into these files in order to find those stories of public interest that are going to make an impact on society. As it so to 100 gigabyte ging, haben wir verstanden, dass daraus echt große Geschichten werden. Und als es mehr als ein Terabyte war, haben wir verstanden, dass sehr viele sehr große Geschichten darin stecken. Und natürlich stieg die Aufregung und das Leuchten, glaube ich, in unseren Augen als wir gemerkt haben, da ist auch nicht nur eine Spur zu einem Staatschef drin, sondern zu Dutzenden Staatschefs. We were working with more than 100 media organizations in more than 70 countries. They're still publishing stories. And then, of course, it's up to the authorities to decide what to do. Our job as journalists at that point is done. We have revealed what we have seen. So now we're waiting for the slides. <laughs> Just as explanation why I'm standing here and not talking. <laughs> <laughs> here you go. So um, I'm very happy to be here and to see so many here. And um, for me, as I'm the, the, the person who started the Panama Papers, for me this is still a very strange thing to talk about it because um, it's very personal but when I look at the figures that I see here then it's such a monster story it's um, I received 11.5 million documents it was one year of work for many many people 400 reporters around the globe 100 media organizations in 80 countries and two prime ministers has, had to step back that's this sounds so so overwhelming, so it helps me for for my personal history to think back that this all started three years ago on a very bad day. <laughs> because I was visiting my parents' house with my wife and my kids, and they all became sick. And it, I mean really sick, um, like vomiting sick. <laughs> And and I was the only person still standing. Um, and in this very bad situation, the first contact happened to the source of the Panama Papers. So when I received this message here, um, I was sitting in the living room of my parents and listening if everybody was asleep or someone was, you know, crying or vomiting uh, and it sounded really good because usually if you have a new source um, or no if someone wants to tell you a story they send you long letters and things are highlighted like here and uh, you know big in capital letters and bold uh, um, and this is always bullshit you know it, no one needs 19 pages in a word document to tell you a simple story and that person, whoever it may be, started very simple. I said, my name is Chun Do, which my educated guess is his name. <laughs> and I got, a, I got a lot of data, so um, I was really interested. And if you have a new source or someone who could be your new source, you have to show your interest, because otherwise the source would go away. Um, so I try to answer and I, I try to think about what you answer because you also so there are so you have to be you have to seem interested and at the same time there are some boundaries even legal boundaries so for example I'm not allowed to say to this person um, I want everything you can you can give me about Nike or whatever because then I would ask him to maybe do a crime because maybe this person was stealing. So I can't say 
you know, bring me more. I only can say, I look at whatever you give me, which is a big difference legally, <laughs> not in reality, but whatever. So I tried to be uh, a good journalist and then I heard my son vomiting and I went up and I changed the sheets and I bought some tea and, I, and some healthy stuff and got back to this person and was really trying to be good. And, and then I saw some first documents and I realized where the documents came from because they came from Mossack Fonseca, a law firm in Panama, which nobody knew back then. And they sold offshore companies, mostly anonymous offshore companies for people who want to hide their traces when doing all kinds of financial stuff. For example, money laundering, um, or other crimes, or they're just you know, hoarding money on a bank account in Switzerland, and the bank account would be owned by the offshore company, so nobody knew who was the real owner. This is the kind of stuff that Mossack Fonseca sold. And I knew the company from former investigations, and I only knew them as a black box, you know, as a whole. Whenever I tried to dig out the real owner of a company from Mossack Fonseca, no chance I would find it. So, for example, you find this ship that was smuggling like arms or trucks from Africa into the world or wherever, and um, you see the owner of the ship is some offshore company from, from Mossack Fonseca. You would never find out who is the real owner because it's like, you know, you just ran against the wall. They have some nominee directors. This is um, mostly Panamanian people who, who don't even speak English. We found one woman who was the director on paper of 35,000 companies. Again, my guess is she was not really directing those companies, but her job is to sign away whatever you pay her for. And, but the effect is the only public figure of that company is her. And she's not the owner. So that's what Mossack Fonseca is. And this is what, why I was really interested. And I tried to tell this person that called himself John Doe that um, I'm the right guy. And it was a kind of exhaustive day. Um, but in the end, I got some more documents of um, um, the the leak that we now call the Panama Papers. Back then it was just some strange guy giving me documents. And so I decided um, to form a team to look at the first documents. And that's German, ich is me. So that was the phase one, sorry for the German. It was phase one was, was me. And um, so my team and me, um, we looked at the first documents and we saw a story from Argentina that wa weren't re really interesting, wasn't really interesting, um, but it showed that, that we, we, me, I had, I could look inside Mossack Fonseca. I could see the emails, the how they are talking about what they're doing. I could see the documents and, and I had some bank transactions from an Argentinian guy to Germany worth 60 millions. So my thought was, that's not my story, but where this comes from, there might be some really good stories. So that was w what, I, what I tried to explain to, to um, the leaker, that I, I'm really, really interested in Mossack Fonseca. That's Mossack Fonseca. Soon we have to say this was Mossack Fonseca because they announced last week that they will stop their operations. Um, because we damaged the reputation in an irreparable way, they say. And I can't say I'm sorry for that. <laughs> when I started um, looking into Mossack Fonseca, they had 48 offices around the globe. Um, meanwhile, they are down to three, I think, and uh, soon they will be gone. Um, for me, Mossack Fonseca was a very interesting topic, not only because of all that I told you already, but also because one of the founders, Jürgen Mossack, is from Germany, actually. He's even from Bavaria. He was born very, very close to where, where, where I live. And his father is quite interesting, too. He used to be a Nazi war criminal. He was Waffen-SS Hauptmann. 
And later after the war, he moved to be a CIA agent, <laughs> which, is, which is quite a move. Uh, and <laughs> no, not uncommon. Yeah, right. That, that's right. And he went to Panama, and where his son studied law, and started then this uh, this company. So I I told the Liga again and again that you know this is fantastic and so insightful. And the effect was I received more and more documents, ten and then hundred and then thousand and then ten thousand, and then five gigabyte and ten gigabyte and we already, me and my team, we already saw them, some really good stories. So one story was the story about the then sitting Prime Minister of Iceland. And the other story um, was about the best friend of Vladimir Putin, a uh, well-known artist in Russia, a cellist, um, who said that he is not a businessman, he doesn't own a million. So we found billions, maybe that was his misunderstanding when he told <laughs> the New York Times that... Um, and, but again, he's an artist and uh, we found two billions moving around in his offshore companies and um, later a Russian reporter asked him about those companies and those were founded in 2010, 11, 12 or something like this and he said, I can remember, this must have been around perestroika when I tried to be a businessman too. So very clearly he had no clue that his name was being used. He just, like the Panamanian fake nominees, he just signed the papers. And for the bank account in Switzerland, um, the, the Gazprom bank, they did a due diligence form on him, so to find out if he's related to any very important persons or politically exposed persons. He's the godfather of Putin's daughter. daughter. So, but he ticked the box, no, I have no relation to any politically exposed person. So he or whoever made this slide, obviously. And, but we know now where they needed all the money because Vladimir Putin explained himself live on television, he said that his friend is only caring for talented Russian musicians. So he was buying very expensive instruments for them, like cellos and stuff. Um, so there must be a huge barn somewhere in Russia <laughs> where they put the all the instruments they bought for two billion US dollars. <laughs> or it was a lie, but I don't want to say that Putin is lying. So, um, But we realized this is this is quite good and, and it's more than, than I can handle alone. So I asked my colleague Frederick Obermeier to join the team. And he's got the same last name, which is just a lame joke. We're not related, we're not brothers, we're not married, we're just colleagues. And, and um, this is our new team. And we started to, to, um, to really dig inside what we got. So um, we, we told our bosses that um, we are not available anymore for the daily work of a daily newspaper, um, which they accepted because we, we dramatically overemphasized what we, what we got, what we found. So we said, this is so great, it's so great. And like a week later, we said, it's really, it's really that great as we told him. So um, that was a repeating moment. And um, we also became a little paranoid in those days because we understood slowly the story about Putin, but you also had uh, already found a very fast found leads from under, from more scandals, the money, money of dictators. So the sign there reads, uh, please always lock the door, thank you. And that was the feeling that <laughs> we had. And at the same time, so we were now the two of us and we had time and it was all good, but the data kept growing and kept coming. So um, when we had a million files, <laughs> we realized we're not going to do this, the two of us. And 
And also, I speak neither Russian nor Icelandic, but those were the two biggest stories. So it was kind of clear that we needed help. So we asked the International Consortium for Investigative Journalists, the ICHA, which is a non-profit based in Washington, D.C. And they, are, they already led the, the investigations um, Luxembourg leaks, which you might know, or Swiss leaks or offshore leaks. And they, this is like a, like a club of investigative journalists around the world. They have members in, I think, 140 countries and more than 200 members. Um, so what they do is they connect investigative journalists and they say like, hey, there's a guy working on the same topic. Why, why don't you do it together? Or they take data that one of us is receiving. I say one of us because I'm a member in this organization. And then they offer to many in this, in this organization to be part of the collaborative before, like with Luxembourg Leaks and like we wanted to do with the panel papers and we hoped they would do it. And, and we, we at our side also made a kind of a big decision because usually as an investigative journalist, uh, you don't share, you know, you keep for yourself what you got. You don't let even your colleagues in your newspaper see or know what you got because they could steal it from you. That, that's a big danger. So um, um, when we told our bosses and our colleagues that we would share the data with the ICHA chain, many colleagues abroad, um, many didn't really understand that they were like, why on hell would you do that? It's, you know, it's our scoop. We have it exclusive. Why would you just give it away? And we had to explain them. So we had to think about why we want to do this. Aside from that, we find it kind of cool to be in the middle of the next investigation of the ICHA. So um, the main thing is obviously this is too big for one medium. It's just too big and it was still growing while we were talking. And the other one I already said, we needed help to, for the languages. But also, we would have lost so many stories. In the end, 5,500 stories originated from the Panama paper. So different stories around the world. And I would maybe have found 50 of them, the German angles. We didn't have that many stories in Germany, sadly. Um, <laughs> but I didn't even know who to look for. In for Belgium or for Venezuela or for Nigeria. So we needed people to explore the data or we would lose many, many stories. We didn't know how many stories because we didn't know how big this whole thing would grow. But, you know, what we did is we were looking for international scandals and then we threw in the names of those people and we found so many of them that I was really, really getting nervous because we thought this is like a trap. Someone, you know, is, is kidding us or, or trying to selling us fake documents. So we also did a lot of fact checking. So we took all kinds of public data available and and cross matched it with the data we had. And we uh, we took our court records where we knew this is proven and and had been in court already. For example, the Siemens bribery affair um, in Germany 10 years ago, they had used Mossack Fonseca companies to bribe some officials in Argentina. And we had exactly those, those companies in our data, so we could compare them. And we didn't find a single point that would made, have made us nervous about that. So we thought, okay, we gotta, we gotta cope with this. This is real, this is authentic. And but the main argument for our bosses was that, that um, now it's right, we would get all the attention. If we would start publishing, the attention cake would all be ours. No one else would get a share of it. The moment we share the data, you know, our share gets smaller because The Guardian also publishes and Le Monde and Le Soir and they also get attention. So not all the attention is on us. But through the fact that we had so many partners and we all published at the same time, 
we got this huge attention around the world that the cake grew so big that while our share was relatively smaller, the share was way bigger than the whole cake we had before. And this strange allegory convinced my boss in the end. Um, and later we realized that it's also a kind of protection for journalists because in the moment we can say 400 colleagues have access to the data, it doesn't really make sense to take one of us out because then you end up with 399 really angry colleagues of mine um, who would try to do exactly my work and give the story more attention and not less attention. So that's another thing that, that's um, a huge advantage if you're doing this kind of work, if you share. The Panama Papers could not have been stopped by no one. It's no way. If you have more than 80 media, no, more than 100 media in 80 countries, how would you stop this? You can stop maybe in one country. Maybe you can stop The Guardian, but you can't stop Le Monde and The Guardian and newspapers all around the world. So um, that's a re really good thing. And we used, we, we took advantage of this when we realized, for example, that um, our partners in, uh, in the Arabian world could not publish some stories, then we published it on our homepage in English and they could send the link around, at least. I mean, it's not the perfect world, but, but, but it helps. So the team grew a little bigger um, with, the from with the guys from ICHJ and they also um, um, took some more in, but at the same time we, took, we, we told everybody, look, don't do your final searches in the data because the data is still growing. We still receive more data. And here's what we had in the end. It's nearly five million emails and uh, more than two million PDFs. Those are <laughs> the most important things for us. And um, this is just too big. And it's even if you, if you s look at it relatively, you see those leaks here. The offshore leaks, Cablegate, Luxembourg leaks, Swiss leaks. Those were big leaks. And at that time, some of the biggest leaks that we'd seen and then you look at the leak that we received and, and this is huge. And that's good and it's bad. <laughs> because I didn't know how to handle this anymore. I'm not a computer nerd, I'm not a data journalist. I'm just a journalist who slid into this and then I had to do safety copies of those external hard drives and, and I even had to get an external hard drive first. When I told the guy in our newspaper, you, you know, we can't, we in Germany, we can't just go and buy something. You know, we have to ask the guy who is responsible for buying things. Um, so I told him that we need an external hard drive and he told me that it's not allowed to store data outside of our servers. And I explained to him that um, this is very special and back then when I asked him the first time, I even said, look, I need to meet someone on a parking lot. So if you don't come with the service to the parking lot, I need something else and I don't want to bring my laptop because I'm afraid of someone stealing it, especially this guy. So he said, yeah, I will think about it. And then he, he ordered an external hard drive and this took like five weeks. <laughs> Meanwhile, I bought it myself <laughs> and forgot the guy, and then he came and said, look, here's your hard drive, the ex external hard drives, and it had power cords, as if in parking lots <laughs> you can... <laughs> so th this is our department, <laughs> and we needed their help <laughs> with the data. Um, and so when the data grew and grew, when we had the first of those things, I went to my boss and I said, look, my laptop is not good enough for this data. I need a really good one, 1,500 euro. And he said, okay, if you really need it. So I went to the guy who buys laptops and he said, can't do this. 
it's not, it's not in my you know, formulas, I can't buy this. So I went to a shop and bought it myself and th then made them pay it. It's my expensive. And I got three calls telling me that this is not the right way to buy things. And I told everybody, I know, <laughs> thank you very much, go to my editor. Um, <laughs> and um, then we received more data and when we had a terabyte, the laptop was too small. So I had to go back to my boss and I had to tell him that we need a new computer again. And uh, we set up a formal way to buy a personal computer for 5,000 euro for our investigation. So I didn't have to buy it myself. It was a big relief. And uh, so we started to work with this and the data kept coming and coming and coming. And two months after we had the new computer, we reached two terabyte and the computer was not working anymore for the data. So I had to go back to my boss and, <laughs> and tell him, I know I said, I think that the, the new one will be good enough, but it's not. And, uh, but you can decide, you're the boss, you can decide if we need to have the data here readable or if it's enough that the ICHA in Washington has got a copy and we can search whenever it works with the internet, you know. <laughs> and he said, no, of course, but this is our data and we need to have it here. Then I told him the price um, of the new computer, it was 18,000 euro. Oh. <laughs> and he couldn't move back. <laughs> so we bought it. And, and I had to handle it, which is a problem, be because as I said, I, I, um, I damaged two external hard drives. I did not tell the guy, I just um, bought myself new ones. Um, and I'm using them now privately. Um, and my problem is I, I lose small passwords, you know? <laughs> and now we had those huge passwords because everything had to be encrypted. Um, I was going crazy with all this data, so I explained to my boss that we need a data journalist um, and we hired a data journalist. And from then on, life got much better for me because now she's taking care of all that stuff and she's fantastic. And uh, 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 um, like everybody was happy with this decision. Um, I think even the data. So the, the tech side was under, was under control. The human side was not. That, that's another issue that we had because, as I told you, we invited new colleagues to our team, the ICHA, and they would approach you know, colleagues in Belgium, Le Soir, and in France, and wherever. And um, now let's start here. So, we had some first meetings with the colleagues that we already knew here in Washington, where the two of us explained in very bad English what we got. And we tried to motivate them to work with us. And um, I was very, very nervous because this was, a, this was a room with a few in the White House. And there were so many famous journalists, as you know, some of the best in the world because they were members in the ICHA. And you only get a member there um, by invitation. So, so if they think you're a really good investigative journalist in your respective country, they ask you if you want to join. And so those people were sitting around here and, and the two, the two Obermeyers, <laughs> uh, uh, and they still call us brothers. We explain to every single one of them. They don't care. They say, it's better for my imagination and also it's better to remember you. Um, so. It was good that we had more people because from, from the moment, of course, from the moment we got new guys from other countries, they were looking for other names. So we found more leads, more and more leads. With every person we invited, we had more leads. So that very soon we came up with more than 70 leads to heads of states, which is a number that I still can't believe when I see it there. But Still, it's a fact, and, uh, uh, and, and th that was a fantastic thing. The bad side is that I don't know how many reporters you know, but if you know a reporter, reporters and journalists per se, they tend to be difficult persons. Please don't tell that to anybody, but um, th they are likely to be ego shooters some way, and um, very protective. They all know it all. And 
they are very important. Um, so it's hard to work with one reporter or a bunch of reporters, but we had 400 of them. And we had to work with them for one year in secret. Uh, and this is my drawing, uh, the new team. I'm very talented. Um, the problem was that it's, while it's funny that you, you get calls like every day from someone in the world who thinks that he has a better idea than you already made, made a decision about with the ICHJ about when to publish, how to publish, uh, um, where to meet, what kind of discussions to lead. Um, the bigger problem was that we had a source to protect and this, this one year that we had to work secretly on the data. Um, usually if, if you want to know the best kept secret of a journalist, you go and buy him two beers because then he will tell you everything he's working on because he's so proud on his work because it's so important. Um, so we had to we had to do something that really every reporter hates. We had to set rules for them. Um, the most important rule was shut up and followed by shut up and encrypt if you really have to talk. Um, and we did really seminars about how to encrypt webinars via the internet and we even encrypted when we asked, when Frederick asked me if I want to have lunch with him because we wanted to get used to this, that you encrypt whatever you are, whatever you're communicating because the danger is so big, not only of exposing the source, but also we had colleagues in Russia and in Saudi Arabia and in Southern America in in Venezuela, for example, and if they would have been exposed before they have been able to publish, they would have been in a huge danger. So um, we told them that, and of course we would lose s stories. I mean, if they tell another colleague, then they would run away with the story. That that's not the idea. Um, another rule was we share whatever we find. So when I found a good story, I would immediately post it in the iHub. The iHub is like the Facebook for investigative journalists in this team. You can post your findings, you can comment on other findings. For example, I say, you look, I found this guy, I don't know who it is. And another one would say, hey, it's Putin's best friend. And the next one would say, I even spoke to him once. He's a strange guy. And so you can work on this platform, which is very secure together. And the, the problem is on the other um, way around. So if no one is posting the best stories very early and then you might have the feeling that n no one is sharing the best stories, so why should I? And we wanted, we urged everyone to share as much as possible, to work as collaboratively as possible um, because this was for the best. For the In the Russia story we worked with more than 20 reporters over the period of maybe one year. And the breakthrough was after eight months and after many puzzle pieces that we found, we finally found that a part of the money was going to the marriage of Putin's second daughter, um, administrated from the godfather of his first daughter. And that was really, I think, you won't come much closer to Putin's money. There's no bank account with Vladimir Putin on it somewhere in the Western world, I'm very <laughs> sure. Um, because it would be very silly of him to do so, and he is not silly. Um, and no bank would accept it, by the way. You need to have someone you can trust who is signing the documents for you. You need to have someone who you believe is not running away with your money, as if someone would dare to run away with Putin's money. But So you need, you, you need a friend or you need a family member. Member. That's why, why I said that we had 70 leads to heads of states because we, we only had 13 heads of states as direct clients of Mossack Fonseca. The other ones are like, you know, the wife, the son, the, the, the cousin or whatever. And we have this very, 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 very telling mail conversation, no email conversation 
from inside of Mossack Fonseca, there was this guy from Venezuela. He had a bank account in Switzerland and he was working for the government back then. So obviously that was not his money. And his lawyer wanted to set up an offshore company to make it even more secure because a bank account with a name on it is a risk. A bank account that's being owned by an anonymous company is not really a risk anymore. So the lawyer went to Mossack Fonseca and said, listen, my client needs an offshore company and that's his name. And Mossack Fonseca, they googled the name and the first hit was he is working in the department for oil in Venezuela. So they said, they went back to the lawyer and said, listen, we can't help you. Your client is not eligible to have an offshore account with us, an offshore company. Um, so we need to have another name for the company. And the lawyer said, why another name? I mean, it's the money of why would he give it to another name? That, that doesn't make sense. And the Mossack Fonseca guy was very calm and patiently said, uh, well, it's still his money. We just need another person that we can put in the records because we cannot take your client. And the lawyer was, well, wh wh why? Ah, okay, what about his son? And Mossack Fonseca said, that's a good idea, but we need this to be clean. So we need a new email where you just tell you need an offshore company in the name of XY. And he ended up choosing his daughter, whatever. But this is how it works. You don't, you don't do it yourself. You need someone around you. So where did I leave to this? <laughs> Yeah, right, we share or we find. Um, the next thing um, that was very important for everybody is that we publish all at the same time and date. Because if you don't, the first thing, the fastest would be the best. You know, I have a story, I run, I publish it. And the idea was that we work collaboratively on this, so we agreed on a common publishing date for all of us. And. Uh, the last thing that we agreed on that we want to be nice and polite all the time. This is the only rule that was multiple times broken. But the whole thing, and that was the big surprise for me, it worked even when we were 400. And the secret is that we managed to establish real, real trust between us. Because the point is, um, we had those rules, but there were no fines. So whenever, when the Guardian would have decided three months ahead of everybody else to go and publish the story about Vladimir Putin and his best friends, there would have been nothing we could have done, aside from really, really, really hating them. But no consequence, no fee, no... So we had only trust, and we had the shadow of the future, as you say in political science, which means that this wasn't the first leak and it wasn't, will not be the last leak, but someone who spoils the party will never be invited again to a collaboration like this. And as we all like this investigation, um, no one would want to not be part of it. And in the end, I think we all understood we have the biggest impact if we publish all at the same date, at the same time. <laughs> because then, you know, if The Guardian and Le Monde and Süddeutsche Zeitung and Miami Herald and BBC and many more are doing the same story at the same time on the same day, people listen. And because they think, okay, this seems to be a really big news. And that's exactly what we want, of course. Because if you have the attention once, then they listen even if it's about something so complicated like taxes. I mean, it's not juicy, it's still taxes. Um, so we had another meeting in Munich, which was um, surreal for me because we invited 100 investigative reporters from over the world, from, from India, from Africa, from, from many nations and, and some even wore their traditional clothing 
And at Süddeutsche Zeitung, only five people knew about this. So um, I had to answer many questions <laughs> in the elevator, and I tried to leave very soon and early uh, and go the stairs the rest of the day. So um, we could work on the stories. Um, we all agreed on the most important topics and we had to finalize our stories, we had to fact check it, we had to lawyer them and then the most dangerous phase came because we had to approach the people we were talking about, uh, we wanted to write about, so we had to write an email to Vladimir Putin and to other people and so this is the stage where they know we also found mafia clans and dictators, so really bad guys. And we entered the stage where they knew that we knew, but no one else knew, because it was not public yet. And this is the biggest problem in investigative journalism, at least one of the biggest problems, because if you have a car crash in, in this time and you're not working in a collaborative team, then nobody will ever know. And so we had a little, we felt a little, safer through the partnership, but it still um, was a very strange day. And uh, I can talk more about this later if you have more questions, but it's, it's, it's really something that also takes you, that takes you personal. So um, right before we wanted to publish, Edward Snowden leaked our leak. 12 minutes ahead of our due date, due time, he published this tweet and everybody was like, we're out, now we're out, now we're out. And everybody was start to really go live and, uh, and uh, 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 this uh, story was live at Süddeutsche Zeitung before the publishing time. Also, they had promised me that this would not happen. Um, because they have it all under control and it's such a complicated URL and nobody can find it except Edward Snowden. <laughs> but in the end it was great for us because many people f followed his link so we had the attention and it was the, the beginning of a very strange and surreal time because nobody of us had thought about what would actually happen. So we, we hoped that people would listen we hoped the Pope would not die on this day, because if the Pope dies, everything else is, you know, <laughs> it's just like you can throw it away, no one is listening. <laughs> but we did not anticipate the reaction that, you know, all the, all the TV networks would pick it up, the New York Times would soon have it on the front page, um, that the, uh, all many, many politicians in many countries around the world would be talking about it, the trending topic at Twitter. Um, um, Vladimir Putin, he condemned us. <laughs> he said Süddeutsche Zeitung would be owned by Goldman Sachs, which is a blatant lie, but what the heck. Um, Barack Obama praised us and, and uh, we even had, uh, no, sorry, this is some of the headlines of the first day. The Guardian and Süddeutsche Zeitung and some more here. And this is the crowd that gathered in the Icelandic <coughs> capital. 30,000 people protesting against the, their prime minister being involved in the Panama Papers. And if you think back on how all this started in the living room of my parents, and then you see one-tenth of the Icelandic population <coughs> going on the street and similar things happening in Pakistan, where their prime minister had to go a year after we published, um, but because of the Panama Papers, still it just took him longer to accept that. Uh, and he is, uh, um, I think that's Malta and London and Paris and Argentina. This is all very strange. This, is, this was, a, so the year of research was already very strange for me and what happened after that is even stranger. Uh, for example, me standing here in Brussels and uh, talking to you. And uh, we used the things that happened to us and what we saw to also write a book, which you can see here. And it's 
meanwhile being translated in many languages, so um, you can read it if you want. And that's it. Thank you very much. So uh, I can't uh, see all so well. Come and stand up. We'll be on this side. And see. There we go. So who has a comment to make? I can see one hand over here. Comments, questions. I think there might be another couple of microphones, but I haven't located them yet. Here's one. There you go. Thank you. My name is Tom Attenstedt. Guten Abend. Hi. Uh, I came here uh, from European Parliament working as a parliamentary assistant. Uh, I was actually wondering when you said that uh, you feel like you were most endangered, um, maybe your life was in danger most when you talked to the people who mm. were uh, concerned by the Panama Papers. How do you feel about it now and wh what do you think is the, is the current threat situation? Is it, is it completely gone or is there some revenge that could, have, could take place? Uh, I'm actually wondering. Thanks. Well, actually, um when we were doing the work, uh, um, I didn't really think about it a lot because in Germany it feels very safe to be a journalist. And back then we said in Europe it's very safe to be a journalist, even if you're an investigative journalist. And um, we had those moments um, when I had ordered food, Indian food, with my wife, and we lived in the fifth floor, and usually they ring the bell. And then we hit, you know, the and they get in and they come up. And on that day, uh, the guy said, it doesn't work, I have to come down. And I started, you know, going down the stairs. And then suddenly I thought, what if that's a trap? And my wife after later told me that she had the same thought after I left. And down, down I met this guy with the Indian food. Everything was fine, but I never had this thought before um, and I lost it again and it came back when when Daphne Caruana Galizia was killed through a car bomb in Malta in October and even more when our Slovak colleague Jan Kuciak was was executed with his girlfriend in Bratislava they both had worked on the Panama Papers it's not the reason why they have been executed. I am nearly sure. We don't know the reason yet. We only So we know in Malta who planted the bomb. They are in jail, but they won't talk. They are just contact killers. And we don't know anything about Slovak, um, the murder in Slovak. So do I feel I'm safe now? Um, I don't really feel that I'm in a big danger because I think, so we were afraid about the lives of our colleagues who published in Russia or in Venezuela or in Nigeria. Um, but, and, and the colleagues who worked in Russia had to leave the country for some weeks. The, the colleague in Venezuela lost her job. A colleague in Hong Kong lost his job. Some, um, some colleagues in Turkey received death threats, but nothing happened in the direct aftermath. But those were the people we were afraid of. We were not afraid about you know, ourselves, really, because if, if, if you don't like a piece published in the Russian Novaya Gazeta, you will be really angry about the guy who wrote it, Romananin, for example. And maybe you even see where did he get the shit from, and then you see the ICIJ in Washington, and then you or maybe also angry about the ICHA, but it's a long way to think where did the ICHA get the data, Süddeutsche Zeitung, Süddeutsche Zeit what, in, in Germany, and then this one guy who received it. So I don't feel in a real danger, but on the other hand, um, I don't um, feel really safe when I'm traveling anymore in certain countries and I, I can't say that those two killings did not leave, uh, you know, something with me. It's, yeah, it has changed. Question. 
To be honest, that's exactly the question I was going to ask before because um, a long time ago I worked with Daphne and I remember when this was exposed and uh, when she was murdered, um, I was curious to see if you had any knowledge or any insight that would link the murder to the Panama Papers and I think you've answered that. There is no link available at the moment. Well, th there are so many links in her case. That's the problem. She made herself so many enemies. She was a, um, a very good investigative journalist, but she also was very harsh and very direct. So if she did not offend someone by the facts, she offended them by her language and, and by the way she called them out publicly. So she was very brave, maybe too brave. Um, but so, you know, everybody is thinking who could have done it. And in reality, they are like, at least six or seven different parties who could have done it. Um, from the Italian Mafia to the L Libyan Mafia who's was smuggling oil <laughs> to the, the elite in the government of Malta who are deeply involved in the Panama Papers. It's a really strange country. I mean, I think in no other European country would it be possible that two ministers in the government did have offshore companies with Mossack Fonseca and they received money from really unclear sources. And they are still two years after the revelation in government. So that, that's, but that's Malta and that's one of the reasons why you really can't tell who went to these contact killers. We think because they are Maltese, the contact killers, and they are not the cream of the cream that you could hire. And usually if the Russians want to kill someone, I mean, we see how that happens, and they send their own guys. And the same is true for Azerbaijan or similar states. So this may be a sign that it's, uh, that, that, you know, it's coming from inside Malta, but it's no proof at all. Sorry. Many, many people are saying so. Yeah, I'm sure. Going to be, uh, up a here. Um, the Port of Panama leaks you have with the Lux leaks, which was also a case about people hiding their money in offshore uh, places, not because they want to, don't want to pay their taxes, to make it very simple. Uh, the Panama leaks were, of course, very huge. There was also uh, it was so clear that things were wrong or illegal, but have, has, have regulations changed on national levels or on uh, international levels so to prevent things happening again, or is it are we going back to business as usual? No, we're not. Um, so many things have changed. We um, we are trying to follow the many changes around the world but it's kind of hard and not our job and I don't speak many of the languages but we know for example in Germany the law has changed now you have to tell the authorities that you own an offshore company if you own a company and you have to be able to explain where the money came from and similar things uh, have been um, made in India for example in, in countries like Ecuador it's now forbidden for politicians to own offshore companies. Um, the European Parliament had set up this special committee to look into the Panama Papers. They, they came with many new proposals for laws and the OECD is really happy because they say leaks and, and investigations like the Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers, they give them the amount of pressure they need to make people move, to make states and countries move. And we have many countries around the world, including Panama now, since the Panama Papers, who agreed to a m more transparent tax regime and to tell the countries if they see citizens avoiding taxes. But said all that, the whole system is still in place, of course. So the offshore system still works. It's harder now to loan the money because there's so much paperwork you have to fill out. But it's still possible and the main thing that I really dislike is that um, the legal part of course did not change at all. So for the 
super rich, um, they still have many ways to avoid taxes and all kinds of laws that they don't like by offshore companies. And so you really have to say that there's you know, a set of rules that apply to the 1% and another one that apply to the rest of us. And, and so that they don't pay the taxes, their share, their fair share, that we all agreed on they should pay because everybody has to pay it. And I think this is so, so unfair and such a huge problem, but um, the finance world uh, has a big lobby. Um, yeah, you, t you talk, I guess it's been the biggest international research, like a real network of journalists working together. So what is your view on this experience? What do you think, what are other areas that this kind of cross boarding journalism could, could develop? And how do you see this kind of future of, of investigative journalism? Because many problems are global and have to be investigated on a global scale, so this is the right answer. So how do you see this developing? I think it's a very late development, actually, because the, 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 the finance world and the world of crime has, you know, has globalized long ago. And so did um, the police and many other organization only we journalists we stayed in our borders inside our borders and when a story that we wanted to do you know crossed the border most of us stopped and I think for journalism the most important thing the Panama Papers have showed is that it works actually that you don't lose out you know the other one is not you know taking advantage of you if you cooperate and share but it's a, it's a win-win situation and it helps to, to do more and better stories. And we already see since, it's now two years ago, there have been as many collaborations as, as never before in the whole world, in, even in the US, where, where they were so opposed against you know, any form of corporations. When uh, the ICHA approached the New York Times four or five years ago for the offshore leaks and asked if they would join this collaborative F4, they, their reaction was, look, you've got this data, you can leave it here, we will deal with it. That's, that's our proposal. And the ICHA just said, thank you very much, <laughs> and left, of course, with the data. Have you ever found out why the source chose you, actually, had it been a renowned member of the ICHA at that stage? And then in the parking lot, have you met the source or was it somebody else? <laughs> and have you found out who leaked it to Snowden? Well, I start from the last one. Um, no, we still don't know who leaked it to Snowden. I had the opportunity to ask himself, but he did not tell me. So, um, the parking lot, um, yes, I met, but the story was a no story. So, that, that happens uh, very often. And the First question, why me? I don't have a real answer because I don't really know it. And if I knew it, I would probably be standing here and say that I don't really know it. <laughs> but I can offer you an explanation because, um, so what I do know is that the Liga has approached other news outlets before, way bigger and international news outlets, exactly the one that you might think of now. and. They did not react in the way that he wished. So I saw some conversations between two news outlets and the Liga, and one was not really responding at all. And the other one um, thought, you know, the story of the first initial documents, it wasn't that great, but she still thought it's a good story and wanted to pursue it. But then she had to go on vacation and then she came back and then she, she, she didn't come back to the Liga anymore. Um, I met this person by chance later, um, but I did not tell her. But <laughs> I have to defend them because, I mean, the Liga did not arrive and say, I got the biggest leak in history, do you want it or not? Um, but he came and said, look, it's, I've got data, and then he sent some documents, and the documents were not really fantastic. We never wrote about those first documents. So the, the big luck that I had while my kids were vomiting was that I knew Mossack Fonseca uh, from before. And so I realized if 
someone has access to the, their internal data, this is really, really interesting. No, sorry, one part is missing. I just want to say, and then, I so if you're the leaker and nobody's reacting, you might think, who would listen? And then one of the founders, Jürgen Mossack, is from Germany. So maybe the leaker thought, let's go to Germany and ask someone there, maybe they are interested. And if you go to Germany and look for someone who did work in the offshore sector, then you can find me. So this is what I have as explanation. And actually, were there moments of when you felt your source was actually getting a bit scared with all the process, etc.? Did you exchange a lot, or was it just uh, data dropping and a couple of fact-checking? And then, if you could tell us a bit what happened afterwards in terms of uh, whistleblowing, etc., legislation, and what happened? So, um, we had an ongoing conversation for nearly one year, and... Um, we talked a lot about safety and security and, and the problem was that the source was completely anonymous for me. So I could not say, um, yeah, you're living in France, go to Paris, I know a lawyer there. Uh, so I, my advice was very general and um, it, we had many ups and downs in our relationship. This is a person who leaked a uh, huge amount of data to someone and th for him this was like a black box, you know. I told him I'm working on it, um, he wanted us to publish in six weeks, I said, this does, doesn't work of course, and I told him I involved many colleagues around the world, but I could have been lying all the time, so he didn't really know. So we, we had, we had, we had m many arguments and always tried to calm him. And when I say him, I say him because John Doe, I don't know if it's a him or her or many. Um, so we even talked about should he go public with his real name and face. That there was one thing that the, the person thought about. And I only could advise him not to. Um, and he didn't want to end up in Moscow like, like Snowden or, or in jail or killed. But on the other hand, it's really hard that, you know, all this happened and you were the reason for it. And you can't tell anybody. This is really hard. And, you know, people get famous. They get to go to Brussels and speak to people. <laughs> and, and, and I was joking. I'm not famous. <laughs> but, um, and he, you know, he can't even tell his father or whoever and um, so I uh, had to be a kind of you know the journalist and a good friend and uh, the priest and, and in the end we stopped our conversation before we published um, for security reasons I destroyed my my laptop and my phone with the two devices I was communicating with him um, I deleted everything and then I took a hammer and really <laughs> hammered it all down which was kind of funny, funny because b both, both devices were leased. <laughs> and I had to <laughs> talk to our department that because they said like a year after, look, the two devices, we would now give them back, the leasing contract. Yeah. And I said, I don't think that this is a good idea because, well. Okay, over here in the middle. Me? Oh, yes, you. Yeah. Hello, thank Hi. you so much. Um, really appreciate a lot of the insights and very interesting. Um, I have many questions, but I'll, I'll keep it short. Um, to one. The, the person one. that you were speaking to, um, when did you realize that the, the information was authentic at, at one point? And I'll ask a funny question. Did you have a code name with this person? Was it always, hey, John, how are you? Um, I didn't have a code name because in the first messages, he referred to himself as John Doe. And I actually, I, I never said, hey, John. Because, it, I mean, it's obviously not his name. Uh, so I only uh, said, hey. Uh, uh, and um, what was the first question? The question was, when did you realize the information was there? Yeah, well, that, there was no, no, no such point. Because um, um, we did fact-checking for months and until the end. And we cross-matched it with all kind of available data, court documents, as I said. We realized that most of the data, all of the data we were looking at was authentic. And we had no one 
who would have claimed afterwards that this is made up and falsified, not even Vladimir Putin. But still, this is 11.5 million documents. I haven't seen a fifth of it. So maybe there are falsified documents in. So what we have to do is we have to be very careful and we have to find a second source. So just one paper from the Panama Papers is not enough to do a story. You always have, so th the problem is the real work is outside the data. You have to verify, you have to find new sources, you have to um, find a way to corroborate the information, to verify it. And in the end, you have to go to the person you want to write about. And the worst thing that can happen is if the, this person is not saying anything. Because if you publish then, although he didn't say anything, and this one document was falsified, then he can sue you. And in some cases, this would be the end of our newspaper. So you could not publish. We threw away many stories. So I'm taking two more questions. One down here. Yeah, Michael. Thank you very much for the presentation and for coming to Brussels. It was uh, fascinating. Um, a question about you. How did this change your life, uh, personally, professionally? Uh, did you go back, have you gone back to being a journalist working on daily, a daily paper, doing daily articles, or is this now sort of, have you become Mr. Panama Papers and this <laughs> dominates your life? No, no. <laughs> no, I, I never worked on a daily basis. I, I, I used to work for the magazine of our newspaper, so that's a weekly, and I did maybe six or seven big stories a year. Um, and then I changed to our investigative department, and, but I still did a lot of projects, so I never did the daily work. Um, and so when we were done with the Panama Papers, um, the whole team was completely exhausted. And then we received the Paradise Papers. And I took a sabbatical for 10 months. I went to the US for a fellowship to Michigan, to Ann Arbor, to witness <coughs> Donald Trump become president of the United States. <laughs> and uh, I did just nothing for some months. And then I started to um, to realize what happened and then I started to feel interest to get back into journalism indeed. I, I mean we had in, in the last weeks um, we nearly did not sleep because we, we had to finish our book, we had to finish our articles, we had to fight with our lawyers, we, there was so much going on and then after we published this got even more intense because you know suddenly the whole world was looking at us. I got calls from the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal in one hour at the first day. Uh, and this was all so crazy. So um, I needed some time off. And, but then I, I realized that now I can do much better work than I could before. Because now, you know, uh, when, when I tried to get information somewhere outside of Germany, I had to explain, but the Novuma, Süddeutsche Zeitung, we have an investigative department, we're working on this and that, and then we really tried to go to work, and we would be so happy if you could talk to us, and, and, and. now I only have to say we did the Panama Papers, and we would, <laughs> be, and it's like, it's really, it makes things easier, we get more sources, we get more leaks, um, and I think I have to live with the fact that I had the biggest story of my life, but that's c perfectly fine with me. Most, most German journalists never have this kind of story. So it's, uh, um, I'm now happy to go to, to be back in, in, in the routines, but we are still doing a lot of investigative work internationally. So it, it didn't really change everything. I've got a final question here. Yes, I assume you had to be very careful also what you ha could say to your family, for example, your wife or... So when you sat in the um, living room of your parents, when you received this line, did you say, oh, I, have received, I think I have received something interesting? And why did you stop sharing things with your relatives? Well, my wife is a... She's a journalist too at Süddeutsche Zeitung, so I am um, very open with her. I told her about this strange thing, but we, we both 
didn't give it a lot of thought because you know it was just a guy handing over some documents. Who knows if there would be a story at all? But uh, I told her, of course, and we had long discussions after we started to find those problematic people, you know, mafia and dictators and 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 so on. And we thought about if I should. Uh, not give my name to the whole thing, uh, but in the end we agreed that in Germany you're not really in danger. Um, but indeed I did not really talk to other people and to my family and, and my, my sister started making fun of about me when I did this um, um, because you're all so secretive. And when we, we always celebrate Christmas all together, together and I always make some three or four kinds of cookies for it. And the running joke was then that m my sisters would ask me, what's the recipe? Oh, no, you can't say, you can't say. <laughs> so, so we tried to, you know, to get, to get this in a funny way. And meanwhile, my mother doesn't really ask what you're working on because she knows that I said, I, uh, I can't tell you, should I lie? I can tell you I'm working on in this or that sector. I mean, you can say something, but if people want to know more, then it's just, um, I can't tell. And for me, that's really hard. I know people who love this, you know, because they have a secret. And like, well, I'm just working. Oh, no, I can't, can't go into that. And, uh, and, and I, I want to communicate. I want that the other, you know, the one that I'm talking to likes me. And so I want to tell things that I'm doing and, uh, and, and, for me, it was really hard from, from, from going as a magazine writer, feature writer, who could tell everything, you know, that I met Lotto Mateos, the German soccer player. He's such an idiot. Uh, 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 <laughs> and now it's like, but I can talk about what happened. That's fine, too. OK, so thank you very, very much. It was absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much.